Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session, Lifestyle Evangelism. Uh, let's just begin this session with a word of prayer. Uh, can anyone of us please lead in prayer? Jafina, can you please lead us in prayer? Yes, Pastor Rick. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class that we are about to have. Lord, we welcome your presence. We welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit to lead us as we listen to this class. Give us an understanding heart and eyes that sees into the deepest secrets of your scriptures. Bless everyone who are listening to this and let us all rise up and preach this gospel boldly so that people could be saved and we can make heaven crowded. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jafina. Okay. Uh, so before we begin today's session, let's just quickly uh, review what we did last week. We looked at chapter 7 and we drew insights from John chapter 4, uh, the whole episode where Jesus meets with a Samaritan woman. Jesus was pushes past the inhibitions uh, that were there, uh, you know, between the Jews and the Samaritans during that time. And we saw that he was able to connect with her. He was able to impact her life. And then we see that there was a ripple effect. So what she experienced, she was able to go and minister to other people as well. So uh, that was a powerful, you know, whole encounter. And there's so much uh, that we can learn from that. And uh, uh, before we start, Chapter 8, just wanted to ask, uh, did any one of us get an opportunity to maybe minister to someone or share the gospel with anyone? It could be through, uh, you know, WhatsApp or even through message or even in person if you've been able to meet somebody. Did anyone get a chance? If you don't mind, you would like to share here? It's all right, even if it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. I can share. Go ahead, Jafina. Yes, so uh, it's not like uh, sharing the gospel, but a girl came to me and asked me so much about, is Jesus the real God? Because Jesus, most of the time, he said he needed the help of angels and uh, he was praying to the Father, then how can we worship him as God? And it was more like saving that girl from out of all the confusions i told her jesus came as human being he didn't come as god he came as human being for us so that he can go through all the temptations and so that he can get it all get all the struggles from us and give us happiness and that's what that's his ultimate plan was so i got this opportunity to make something clear to this christian girl so that she don't lose the hope so that she don't move away from the truth and she can go more closer to God, knowing that this is the truth. Yeah. Right. That's nice. Thank you, Jafina. Anyone else get, got an opportunity? Yes, go ahead, Divya. Yes, Pastor. Uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, sharing the gospel. Yeah, there was a mother who came to our home just for a, you know, play date with the kids. Uh, so uh, I could talk to her and got to know like she is from Cambodia and she is um, they practice Buddhism uh, and all these things. So in between our conversations, I just try to you know bring up uh, like the church that we go or something uh, related to these things. So it's my prayer that ultimately at least uh, by Christmas, you know, I'd be able to uh, invite her to the church that we attend. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. yeah th that's nice. Thank you, Divya, for sharing. One of the things that uh, you can do, Divya, is if she's uh, a, a known friend and you feel that you're going to meet her every now and then, uh, just read up a little bit about uh, her faith. We said it was Buddhism. Uh, so, uh, so just, you know, just get a brief idea about what Buddhism is, what they believe in. Um, you know, uh, so when you, you know, if you can just read up, so you have some kind of a, you know, a, a backdrop for you to even speak to her as well. So that's good. Uh, great that you got that opportunity uh, to bring the gospel. Anyone else would like to share? Last person, then. Yeah, sure, Pastor. I'll do that. Thank All you. Right. All right. 
Welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. What's up? Go ahead. What's up? Um, I've been trying to reach out to one brother. Um, you know, he is kind of kind of uh, backslided, and you know, I've been trying to catch up with him, invite him to inviting uh, inviting him to church and all, but you know, every time he has an excuse. But uh, day before yesterday, I just felt that you know I need to go to his house and minister to hi to him and his family. So like uh, I just uh, like I shared this to my pastor, uh, and my pastor and I we went and ministered to the family. And you know like uh, I just feel that you know like as we encourage the family with the word of God, you know, I believe something has been done in the spirit dreams. Their hearts, you know, like uh, they were all very receptive and, you know, and I believe God will continue to work in their life and looking forward because we have uh, like invited him and his family to the church this Sunday. Yeah, we'll continue on to follow up with him. That's nice. Thank you, Watson, for sharing. Yes. Uh, so even as we go about you know, evangelizing as God gives us these open doors. Remember, uh, what's important is we need to also keep them in prayer because eventually, uh, more than our words, more than what we are saying, it is the Holy Spirit that brings conviction into people's heart. It's the Holy Spirit who will change their lives, right? So continue to keep them in prayer and continue to minister to people. All right, this class, we will look at chapter 8 on understand and reason, right? Uh, I'm on page 26 if you're following on the notes. So we're going to look at this entire uh, you know, sequence that happened in Paul's second missionary journey, right? Now, Paul has finished his, Apostle Paul has finished his first missionary journey. He's come back to Jerusalem. He's all set uh, and he's ready to go for his second missionary journey. <clears throat> now, the second missionary journey lasted for about three years. It is said that the second missionary journey was the most impactful time in Paul's life because uh, the most number of churches was planted. The second missionary journey has, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful events uh, uh, that happen. Example in uh, in Athens, in Greece, in Corinth, in Ephesus, uh, even his small visit to Rome as well. So, um, so we're going to look at how Paul was able to you know uh, uh bring the gospel by understanding the other person's religion or religious beliefs and also how he was able to reason with the people uh during his second missionary journey so in this missionary journey paul went into asia minor he went into europe and he visited some of the most influential cities in the world including philippi Thessalonica, uh, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, all of Asia Minor, and then uh, also going into Europe. Now, in today's class, we're going to look at the episode that happened in Athens, right? Now, let's do a little bit of a background right? uh, as to what was the condition or what was the moral beliefs, what was happening during the time the great apostle Paul went there to minister to people. Right. As we all know, Athens is uh, the capital of modern Greece. And Athens, even now, is considered uh, the intellectual capital of the world. You got, you, you know, the, the greatest minds came out of Athens. Uh, uh, this whole city was, was named after this Greek god, goddess named Athena. And being one of the oldest cities uh, in the world, it was constantly inhabited with people. So there was always people coming in, people moving out, people coming in and going out. So uh, some of the great philosophers, Socrates, um, uh, Plato, Aristotle, came out from uh, Athens. Now, uh, if, if you're you know, aware of a little bit of history, these were the brightest minds, uh, you know, Aristotle, Plato, uh, uh, and uh, Demosthenes, uh, they were all intellectual people with high understanding, right? Uh, they would, uh, you know, Athens was considered a place of learning, a place of science, a place of philosophy. Uh, and so the 
you know, it is said that uh, if you're in Athens, you're considered, you're already considered as, a, a, you know, a learned person. It is also said that during those times in Athens, there were very few people who were illiterate, meaning not learned. Even the people in the marketplaces were, had an idea about, you know, religion and uh, philosophies and God and arts and so even the working class professionals, right? So, uh, so Athens was filled with this kind of philosophy. Now, during this time, there were two kinds of philosophies that were running around. One was called the Epicurean and the other was called Stoicism. Right. And you can see that in the in, in the book of Acts also, uh, they mentioned the word Epicurean and the Stoic believers. Right. Now, what are these two belief systems? The Epicurean is followed by the teachings of a person named Epicurus. Now, what he did was what he believed was everything happened by chance. Right. Uh, and death is the end of all. And. All that who all of them who believed in gods were, uh, and and gods were remote from this world. They didn't care about us. They they had no relationship with us. And the end of life, the chief end of life, is the pleasures of this world. Right. So that's what Epicureans believed in. And then there was the contemporary of Epicureans uh, called Stoics. Now the Stoics was uh, this whole belief system was started by a man named Zeno and they believed in something very different to the Epicureans. They believed that uh, everything was God and God was like a fiery spirit. So when God created us, there was, you know, this fire of the spirit of uh, inside us uh, remains in us. And so when we die, that little spark or that fire goes back and reunites with the God of the universe. Uh, they also believe that, uh, you know, there will come, there, were, there are times when the world will disintegrate and it will come back to form again, right? Now, all of these philosophies were man-made, yet these were man-made by men who were highly intellectual, right? So these were the two beliefs. You got the Epicureans and you got the Stoics. Right, a learned place, intellectuals. Paul, the apostle, is ready to go into this place to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the best part, you know. The, the Bible does not say that, uh, you know, P Apostle Paul was afraid or he was, you know, doing some studies and trying to find out. No, the Bible doesn't teach anything about that. He knew that he's going into a place where they're going to be learned people and there could be persecutions ahead. He knew right where he was. He knew uh, the things that is going to happen ahead of him, right? So Paul sent a message to uh, Silas and Timothy who joined him into this second missionary journey. Now, we got a background of the people in, in Athens. Another aspect that we can also understand is since they believed in different kinds of gods, there were gods and goddesses everywhere across the country of Greece, especially in Athens, because it is said that if any of these intellectuals would see a star right, and they somewhere in their heart, they feel, OK, that could be the star which God is sending a message to us. Right? So it becomes a whole new philosophy a whole new kind of a teaching, right? And people would grasp it. People would accept those kind of teachings because these are intellectual people, right? It is said that, you know, in Athens, it was more easy to find gods than people, meaning there were more statues and more uh, temples around in Athens than people, right? Uh, and so it was... Uh, it was a it was a place of idol worship. It was a place of immorality. It was a place of sexual immorality. Uh, life was just you know even though they were very intellectual, they were living a morally defiled life, right? 
So Paul goes in and what does he do? He gets, he engaged with people in the city, right? He reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue. So first he went, he went to the synagogue. He began to reason with the Jews. He said, okay, Jews, you should know that the, we, we are waiting for the Messiah. He began to proclaim the gospel to them. And then he went to the Gentile worshipers in the marketplace. Now, the marketplace is called the Agora during the times of Athens. Now, if you've seen a few pictures, you can uh, see a few of them. It is, it is an open space, right? Uh, and right at the center, you have like a small kind of a stage, right? Uh, elevated platform. And people could come there and speak whatever they wanted to. Right. And so on the all throughout or around this small elevated place would be uh, um, uh, would be a, like a marketplace. People would be selling things, uh, selling, you know, uh, household items or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cloth and uh, business and all these things were happening around. And so if anyone had any intellectual idea, they would come there and start speaking. So anybody could do that. Something like. Uh, uh, speaker's Corner that's in the UK where, you know, anybody can go there and speak anything they'd like to. So Paul goes there and he begins to sp speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? People, people came and they listened to it. Uh, this was a place where political ideas are shared, uh, uh, religious ideas are shared. Uh, and, and so people began to listen. What is this man talking about? Now, we've heard the, the Epicureans may have thought, OK, we heard that there is a God, but he's not here. He's just fire. But what is this man talking about? God came in the form of flesh. So they all were listening to this man, Apostle Paul. And probably the Stoics came and they said, OK, we've, we know that there's a God. We know that death is the end. Uh, uh, but uh, this is something new. We don't know about forgiveness of sins. We haven't heard of this. Uh, somebody dying on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. It's an offense. You know, it is actually the the, the persecution was founded by the uh, by the Persians. And, you know, the Persians founded the whole thing of crucifi crucifying, crucifying people. Uh, and then the Romans mastered the art. So Rome, the Roman Greco culture, the Greeks knew what, you know, uh, why would someone be crucified? They knew that, okay, only murderers and, uh, you know, people who have not abided by the law will be crucified. And here comes Paul and he's telling them, hey, there was a man named Jesus. He came, he's sharing the gospel. He's talking about how Jesus died and he took up our sins. And so the Stoics and the Epicureans, these two belief systems that were contemporary, they said, okay, Paul, you're out of your mind. Who are you? Who, who are you? Why are you come here? You're out of your mind. What you're talking is not making sense at all. Right? Now, listen, Apostle Paul, you may be learned, but we are much more learned because we are in, uh, you know, we have probably studied in the Academy of Plato and uh, we know all these things. We, we see the stars. We know the science. We do uh, study on science. Apostle Paul. Mr. Paul, you don't know anything of all of that. You're talking about a man who came into this world, took up our sins, died on the cross, and rose again. And, and when we believe in him, we have forgiveness of sins. It does not make sense. What are you talking about? And so after all of this, they said, okay, we'll do this. You come to the main center, you know, and you preach this whole thing you're talking about. It sounds like a new study. It sounds like a new philosophy. You come. You come to this place. Uh, this place is called the uh, uh, Aeropagus. Now, the Aeropagus is, a, is like a city council. So, for example, uh, if somebody has legal problems, right, uh, it's a place of court, right? They would meet there. Judicial system, educational uh, ideas, educational policies, cultural policies, religious matters. Everything is being discussed in this place called the Aeropagus. It's also called the Mars Hill, right? Now, uh, they said, Paul, you're talking something which is very new to us. We haven't heard of this. 
you come to Mars Hill, to Aeropagus. We're going to call all our leaders, the Stoic leaders, the Epicurean leaders, our religious leaders. Now, since this is a religious matter, we're going to call all of them. And we will listen to what you have to say. And so Paul comes there, right, at a, at a given time. In Acts chapter 17, 22 and 31, Apostle Paul delivers this amazing, amazing sermon called the Sermon on the Mars Hill. He begins to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He begins to, he starts off by saying, I see that you people are God-fearing people. Everywhere I go, I see there are temples. And I also see an inscription saying to an unknown God. So he begins to preach this whole gospel. And towards the end, after he finishes, there were some of the leaders in the Epicurean and the Stoics, religious leaders. They said, hey, we want to hear more of this. While others said, you're not, you're not making sense at all. It doesn't make sense. They just you know, pushed him away and went on with their work. But the others said, we want to understand more. And we want to uh, you know, believe in what you're saying. We need to understand more. So we see here that Paul did not only go to uh, you know, places like, like example, Galatia, where they were not very too intellectual. Uh, you know, uh, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, the churches in Galatia, uh, they were not very intellectual. So Paul was able to minister to both the unintellectual, the the poor, the sick, the the uh, you know the just the regular working class people, and here. Paul was also able to minister to the highly intellectual people, right? Now, uh, let's quickly, to put this into context, all that I've shared, let's read Acts chapter 17, 22 to 31. Can one of us please read that? Acts 17, 22 to 31. So Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all aspects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries for the habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist. And even some of your children, some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought to not, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by an art and thought of man. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you for reading that. Right. So we're going to pick up. We see here Apostle Paul so brilliantly, uh, you know, brings in this whole um, aspect of the gospel. Now, let's pick up a few points. First one, without condemning, Paul appreciates their inclination towards God. Right. So what does he say? He says, I see that you are very religious. Right. Now, the mistake that we may make sometimes is, I see that you are very religious, but you're, the problem is you're worshipping a wrong God. Right. Sometimes we may end up saying that. We may end up condemning others. But Paul didn't do that. Right. He didn't say your, your, your intellectual, has, intellectual uh, thoughts are all wrong and you don't even know what you're doing, you're, you know. He, he didn't condemn them, but he appreciated them. He said first, hey, I see that 
you are all are religious right looks like you are searching for something you're searching for a god right and so paul was able to recognize where people were in their spiritual quest meaning he said okay this never happened in galatia in this first missionary journey uh, this never happened in the places that he ministered to before but here he's seeing that hey people are searching for something they're searching for a god and so paul uses that as a background and he says you are very religious right he does not bring condemnation but he says he, he tells them hey, you're very religious that's a good thing you're searching for a god that's a good thing right so firstly even as we evangelize see where they are in their spiritual walk either they may be uh, you know atheists they may be agnostic they may be people who have a lot of questions they may be christians who have turned from the faith they may be people who have uh, you know come to know the lord but you know they don't really uh, understand i know of many christians who just you know have lived a, their whole life being christians but they still don't get the concept of trinity they still it's too confusing for them right so get to know people right get to know where they are standing you know so if a christian or 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 somebody comes and shares with you hey uh, how can you know trinity god be three gods right now the first thing we shouldn't say is hey uh, you should understand these things you no know, you've been a christian for so long or uh, you no know, this is the basics of christianity like no so first thing you can do is appreciate them right appreciating what 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 they are see you're not appreciating what they believe in but you're appreciating the person that you're ministering to right so paul is not apostle paul is not appreciating their belief system but he's appreciating the people for the search for their search for god right so people like you know ask you questions uh appreciate them hey that's a good question uh you know uh, or if they say you know uh, they're asking you questions about how can jesus be a uh, god and man you know you appreciate them you say hey uh, yes that's a good question and uh, you know even i had been thinking about this uh, even when i was not a believer uh, you know and these are the things that help me and i'm sure you, you know you, so what you're doing is you're appreciating them as a person and the question that they ask and and you're honoring uh, their question right so first thing do not condemn right apostle paul could have you know he had the power of the holy spirit he had the anointing of god upon him yet he humbled himself right the mistake that we may make sometimes is and i've seen it in a lot of especially pastors and leaders around uh, not to condemn them but i've seen that you know they're anointed and strong and you know powerful in the word but when in certain things they bring condemnation upon people or other religions and so that is why even though we are filled with the holy spirit we are to learn how to minister to people right appreciate them secondly he addresses one of their ignorance right meaning he uses something that they can relate to right what chapter 17 was 23 says i see that everywhere you have gods and one of your gods even said to an unknown god so now apostle paul is using that that whole statue that he saw right he's he's using that as a base listen you're searching for god that's great too you also searched so much that you've also put an inscription saying to an unknown god a god that you don't even know so he's using their own uh you know gods to bring forth the gospel he's trying to relate to something he's using that inscription that god that statue that he saw as a starting point to bring the gospel right he used it as a backdrop listen you you're searching for an unknown god i will tell you who that unknown god is god has revealed it to us and probably the heroes was like okay we've had this you know this statue here for over maybe 100 years now and to an unknown god and now this person comes uh and he's talking about some you know man who came into this world 
uh, and he's saying, I'm going to reveal uh, who this unknown, I'm going to share about this unknown God. And so immediately he catches their attention. Immediately, right? So even we, as we even evangelize with people, use a starting point, use something that they can relate to. One of the most uh, convenient things I believe in sharing to a Muslim, right? It is an example to a Muslim is that you can start off by, you know, talking about Abraham. You got Isaac. You got Moses. You can start off there because they believe in the Pentateuch, the five, the first five books. So you got something to start with, something to relate with them with. Remember this one time. I was with a friend and uh, we were talking. He was a Muslim. And now I know all about their feast uh, of Bakrid, right? Where they slaughter the lamb. Uh, I, I knew it. But so while we were talking, I said, hey, what is this Bakrid? Why are there so many sheep around? What, what, what do they do? He said, Paul, you should know. You're a Christian. You should know. I said, no, I'm not really sure. Can you tell me? And so he was, a, he's a fervent Muslim. And so he knew it in and out, right? He quoted chapter and verse and all of it. And then after that whole thing, he, you know, he began to explain the whole thing. Uh, and so Abraham took Ishmael up the mountain and he sacrificed him. And God, uh, you know, instead of sacrificing him, there was a, there was a ram stuck in its horns, uh, uh, in the truth, in the thorns. And he took that and he sacrificed it to God. And so we celebrate that. Uh, by cutting a sheep. I said, that's wonderful. And so I asked him, so what is it that you learned from that whole thing? How do we apply it in our lives? So he said, I don't know. How do we apply it in our lives? I said, no, because everything, I mean, even the Quran or even the Bible, if you're just reading it, it just becomes a storybook. Um, it's something that we did in school. Read it, it becomes a storybook. How do we apply these things into our life? What you have said? You know, you're a fervent Muslim. How, do, how will you apply it into your life? What did you learn from this? So he said, you know, God can send anyone. Uh, sacrifice our lives are very is very important. The moment he said sacrifice, I, I was able to slowly bring in the gospel. It all started off with one question. What is Bakrid? Right? So I was, there will be times when we can relate to people. Right? Uh, and so even in, in if you're speaking to, let me see, let me, maybe a Jehovah's Witness, right? Now they know about Jesus. They know uh, about the, you know, the, the word of God. Uh, and they know the whole aspects of Jehovah in the Old Testament. And so again, you got something that you can relate to, right? If you're talking to a, a person who's an atheist, doesn't even believe in God, uh, you know, we came out of nothing. Uh, so again, we need to find some point that a point of reference for us to bring forth the gospel. Now, it may be difficult at times. You may say, you know, uh, Paul, you've tried it before, uh, but for us, we don't have a starting point. No, God will, you know, even as we pray, the Holy Spirit will bring something uh into remembrance you know that's a, the work of the holy spirit he brings to remembrance he gives us the wisdom to ask the right questions right one of the gifts of the spirit is the word of wisdom so we need to rely even as we you know use all these relatable points rely on the holy spirit thirdly he he was able to let them know that you know he's made an effort to learn something about their religion Right. In verse 17, verse 28, he says, some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So what is Paul doing here? Brilliant move, uh, brilliant step that Paul has taken. He said, I've read what you guys study about. I've read about your belief system. Right? Your own poets have said that we are his offspring. So I'm not quoting something from my Bible or from my scriptures from the Old Testament. I'm not quoting something from the Jewish calendars. I'm not quoting anything from, you know, uh, our Jewish, uh, you know, uh, studies that I studied in. No, I am quoting something that you all have written. Your own poets have said we are 
also his offspring. So what what is what is interesting here is Paul help them know that hey he's not just randomly coming and speaking something here he's done his work he's done his studies he's gone he's read about us he's made an effort to understand our religion he's not just coming and mocking other religions and going right so this is a very 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 important point right now for example if we want we have a friend who's an atheist now don't just go to them the mistake to do is to go to them and say, hey, you know what, uh, uh, it's so foolish. How can something come out of nothing and it doesn't make sense? How can there be no God? You don't know what you're talking about. Now, that will be condemning the person. But the right thing to do is to go back and to study something about atheism. Get a brief idea. Get an understanding. Yes, that's the effort that we need to take. Right? Uh, Divya was sharing early in the class how... Uh, she was able to share about uh, to a Buddhist. And the first thing I mentioned was go back and study a little bit about Buddhism because it's going to, you know, uh, imagine you're speaking to a Buddhist and you say, hey, who's the founder of uh, Buddhism? And, and, and if you don't know anything, this person who's listening to you will say, hey, you only know about what you're talking about. Why don't you also study this? I study about Buddhism. And so I'm just taking this as an example uh, uh, so we need to be well prepared, right? There are times when, you know, I've got the opportunity to share with the Jehovah's Witness and I was like, I had no idea what, I mean, I had a little bit of an idea, but I realized that, hey, I'm not able to share effectively because I don't know their belief systems. I don't know what they uh, believe in, what they don't believe in. So I didn't have a starting point. I didn't have something that I could, you know, really hold on to and, you know, bring the gospel in. So very important, let them know, right? That you have, you know, read the, their, their religious books. It's all right. Now, you know, one person came up to me, a young man, and he said, uh, you know, pastor, if I read the Quran, uh, won't the devil come and attack me because I'm reading the word of God? And no, nothing's going to happen, right? Don't be afraid. We are here. We know our identity in Christ. We know that the word of God is truth. The only reason we are, you know, reading this and studying this is so that, you know, we we can hold our, you know, uh, the whole thing of apologetics. We will be more effective in that, right? Even as we go on, as you go on to the third year, um, you will be also learning world religions and contemporary cults. And so that will be another asset for you to learn and uh, evangelize even stronger. So, so here's the thing, make an effort, right? To learn about the other person's religion. Um, if, if, for example, you, there's a Sikh and you want to minister to him, go back, study about it, just read it. And I say study, don't, you don't have to do like one, you know, uh, 10 days study or not. Just look at, make points, you know, look at what their belief system is. Uh, just pick up from there, right? Make an effort. Now, after this, he, Apostle Paul brings in that amazing move where he brings in the gospel and he says, this who you are searching for to an unknown God, I'm revealing it to you. It's not made by human hands and God does not need human hands to live in. He does not need a temple uh, to live in. God is above time, above space, above matter. He brings in the gospel talking about repentance, judgment, Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. And, and so powerfully he shares the gospel there. Right. He we see that God, he was not only able to recognize he could relate to some things that they were belief system. He was able to, you know, uh, let them know that he's made an effort to share the gospel. Finally, he brings in the gospel. And it's so powerful. When we look at the outcome, some of them mocked, right? So it's okay if people mock you. It's okay. Yeah. It's happened. It's happened during Jesus' time. It happened during Apostle Paul's time. It will happen when you do it. It will happen 10 years late from now. It will happen till the end of time. The gospel is an offense to people. To some of them, it's an offense. But it is the power of God 
unto salvation. So what happened? Some mocked them. Said, this is you know nonsense. It doesn't make sense at all. But some of them wanted to hear more. And some of them believed in that gospel. Right? Amazing. People in the council, people who were leaders in the Aeropagus council, accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you picture that? Right? Paul is there. He meets with them. These religious minds who may have been studying Stoicism or Epicurean uh, study philosophies for maybe about 20 years, 30 years. These men who are sitting in the council hear the gospel for the first time and they accept Jesus as their personal savior. Right? One of them was Dionysius and another one, Areopagite, highly religious and intellectual people. Paul established a church in their midst. What a powerful work. What a powerful work. He went in alone. He went in. He brought the gospel in front of all these people. Some of them mocked, but some of them, highly intellectual people, believed the gospel, and a church was planted in Athens at that time. How do we know that? Later on, there was a community of believers in Athens. Picture this. A city just thriving with intellectualism, all kinds of gods, all kinds of temples. And all of a sudden, you've got these few believers meeting together, maybe in somebody's house. And these believers are impacting the city of Athens. Later on, we, we see that there's no account of what happened to the church in Athens. I'm sure there would have been a growth. I'm sure that, you know, um, uh, the church would have you know, established itself there. But Paul moves on to Corinth from there, about 55 miles from Athens. And we have a record of what happens in Corinth, right? Just 55 miles. We see that Paul ministered to them. Same thing. Ministered in power. Planted a local church in Corinth. We know the church in Corinth was a church that was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. They were gifted in speaking in tongues. They were gifted in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They were flowing in those gifts. A powerful church in the heart of the city of Greece. So what are we, what are we trying to learn here? God can use us even for the intellectuals. Right? Here are some additional insights of how Paul ministered. He, he was able to do all of these above things that we studied, understand, reason. But here's the thing. His reasoning alone did not do the work. His complete dependence on the work of the Holy Spirit was what did the work. I'm sure Apostle Paul, you know, may have gone back the previous night and said, okay, tomorrow I'm going to go speak in front of these people in Mars Hill. And so he's going back and maybe he did a little bit of a study or just putting it forth, maybe what he did, right? Maybe he did a little bit of a study and then what he would have done, he would have spent the whole night praying and seeking God. And in the morning, you know, they would have, as he would have gone to this place, the power of the Holy Spirit would have worked in their lives. That is why I always say this. Your personal life will reflect your public ministry. Right? If we want a public ministry to be fruitful, we have to look at our personal life, our personal walk with God. Right? And Paul did that. He would have, you know, imagine, you know, history says that Paul was a short, bald man, not very good looking. And with all his bruises and hurts, many times he was beaten. His face was disfigured. He had bruises on his body. Yet they came to listen to this man. Intellectual, highly intellectual people came to listen to him. And they accepted, not, what, not because of Paul, not because of the way he spoke, but they accepted because of the anointing that flowed, that flowed through Paul to the people outside. 
Right? So remember, it is the Holy Spirit, it is the anointing of God that will touch other people's lives. So we need to balance it. Right? We need to prepare ourselves in the natural, right? Be able to, you know, reason, understand, appreciate, share. But all of that is done out of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can't say I'm anointed of God and not know what to speak, right? Or you can't say I know everything here, but not be anointed of God, right? So you got to blend these two together, right? So some of you shared that you all are inviting people to church, uh, uh, you know, sharing the gospel with people, right? That's good. Sit and pray for them. Ask God to minister to them. Ask God to put the right words in your mouth. Uh, ask God to uh, make their heart ready to receive the word of God. And that the seed of God's word will do something in their lives. Another important point, do not get into arguments. Right? Uh, of course, debating is okay. Right? To a certain, you can debate them. Right? Um, and you'll learn more on that in apologetics. Uh, but don't get into arguments, right? Don't get into arguments. The moment you feel uh, a conversation is getting into arguments, stand back. Just walk out. That is wisdom, right? Uh, sometimes we don't have to prove yourself right. I think we should come to this place and say, even if we are proven wrong, it's all right, right? The message is of the gospel is faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we can't prove everything. Sometimes we don't have the answer to everything. Right? So it's all right. So now let's bring all of this into context. If we are talking to a Hindu, if we're talking to an agnostic, uh, how will we bring this gospel in? Right? For a, let's just look at a few examples. Uh, if you look at the pantheistic worldview, Right, uh, meaning, uh, you know, there's there's evil, there's sin, there's suffering, there's karma, there's reincarnation, and all of this. And so, how can we bring in the gospel through that? Right. So say, okay, you know, there is sin, there is suffering, there is evil in this world. There is just there is, you know, when when you're talking about karma, what do you feel about it? And so you're bringing in the gospel now. You know. It may be easy to share in a classroom. Maybe some of us are thinking, okay, it's easy to talk about this in the classroom. But, you know, what about when people are there, you know, and they ask questions, how do I answer them? Or what if I don't say the right things? Yes, it's, you know, it, it is easy to speak about it in the classroom. Uh, but in reality, um, it may be different. But that's okay. We, we are to, you know, Continue to do this. Continue to, you know, minister to people, whether they are comfortable, meaning comfortable in the sense that whether they uh, want to hear it, or sometimes they don't want to hear it, can step back. But but this is the call of God on our lives, right? It, it is something that we are called to do. And, and so God will give us, you know, one of the important things that we can do is bring about Christ's uniqueness, Every religion went searching, you know, there's a search. And it end, that search ends in that, you know, being unfulfilled. Or you can talk about the, the man, Jesus Christ, right? Uh, you know, people say, you know, Jesus was not even a person. Uh, it was, it's just a whole ideology. So remember this one man, he, one person that I was talking to, a young man, he was saying, there's no such thing that Jesus was not, not, you know, was not God. He was not even there during the times. Uh, so I remember going back and I, I, I took printouts. This was come a couple of years back, and I, the printouts was about the, you know, the whole genealogy of Jesus, and that showed that there was forget about Jesus being God, but there was a man who lived in Jerusalem, who was born. And, you know, and, and he did these works, who was crucified. There was a man. It is history. It's proven. Right. So there will be many things that we will have to do. Uh, but even as we do all this, let it be through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we all are studying uh, different subjects right now in our course. Uh, 
it's good it's wonderful that we learn all of this now let me give you this example and I close with this uh when i was in bible college uh you know uh we finished our first term first semester and i got my answer papers on faith right i never forget this 2000 i think it was 2011 or 12 i got my answer paper on faith and i had got 99 out of 100 right i was so happy oh man 99 out of 100 in faith you know i was so excited i said wow uh and so a couple of days later we all our students you know our classmates we planned to go and do some evangelism in their hometown so we we went to andhra pradesh uh and we were ministering there i think i've shared this before but uh, uh and as we were ministering there i was full of you know i thought okay man we are going to do some great evangelism here we went into this small town in andhra pradesh and we went into this church some of the pastors who invited us uh, i was probably 24 years old i i delivered a powerful sermon after the sermon a man who was blind came in front of me and said pray that i can see at that moment the holy spirit reminded me of my faith answer sheet which was 99 on 100 which is so proud of but then in reality i gave myself a big zero i said i don't know if this guy can get eyes how can he get eyes he didn't have eyeballs i thought to myself hey i thank god for that whole event that happened because i realized that hey it's not only about studying and getting 99 on 100 or all of that i paper on paper it's good but if i don't put it into practice in my life it's a waste and i thank god i realized that and i began to pray and i began to seek god so it was now i'm not saying don't do well in your exams right do well in your exams prepare well study well but put it into your life put it into practice all that we study and that's when you know this life of living the life in the ministry will become even more meaningful uh i love god to work in us i love god to minister in and through us now we are learning about lifestyle evangelism put it into practice you're learning about other subjects uh put it into practice right study it read it see where you can improve if you're studying on homiletics and uh all these other hermeneutics and all these subjects put it into practice that you may use it and glorify god in your life amen Amen. Sorry, I've taken five minutes extra. Uh, let's just uh, any questions, any thoughts, anyone? Or we can close in prayer. Right, uh, Divya, I see your question. Can you suggest a good book to study about uh, other world religions? Okay, yes. Uh, there are a couple of books. Uh, there's Jesus among other gods. Uh, sorry, Jesus among other gods by Ravi Zacharias. uh and and so you can start off with this it's a good book he talks about how the uniqueness of jesus uh and and then you, he also talks about uh there's another book called uh, jesus talks to buddha i don't know if that book is available but you can look at it but you can start off with this book it gives a good understanding uh initially so right any questions any thoughts uh shall we close i hope this class is making sense uh and you know uh, impacting each one of us is it okay is it too much uh, information or is it okay 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 thank you all right let's close in prayer uh, john if you don't mind can you please close in prayer father we thank you for the lessons that we learned today we pray oh god that you would be able to put these things to practice and help all of us to really depend on you even as we learn all these subjects oh lord jesus we pray for pastor paul to um continue to bless him thank you for his life and thank you for all the testimonies that we have been listening and be being encouraged oh god we thank you for this time bless each one of us in jesus precious name we pray
Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week ahead. God bless you all.